on your take. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome, welcome. I'm, I'm jamming too hard. I'm vibing too hard. I'm vibing too hard. Welcome, welcome to the Simply King podcast. This is your boy Rodney Perry King himself. And you just tuned into the Soulfully Conscious podcast for humans, simply being humans. This is a late drop. This is a whole different format than I've ever done. I'm, you know, introducing the idea of many episodes. I don't know how I didn't think of this already. And I've been doing this for so long. I could do many episodes. I don't got to, you know, pressure myself to do too much time and put it in, give y'all something and even give y'all something in the in-between if I feel like it. Today's episode, we're talking about how to be wrong and also getting into why that seems to make people's ass itch the way it does, why people are so adverse to just being wrong. You see what side, type of side I'm on? I'm on the right side on some things, but today we're going to talk about the wrong thing. Let's get into it. This Simply King. So for today, for today, we are getting into a concept that I think is, you know, pretty, pretty cool. Um, but I also think that it's something that, you know, we got to talk about. But before we get too deep into the main point, I want to chat with y'all about the beef of the beef of the decade, <laughs> the beef of the decade, Aubrey Drake Graham and Kendrick Lamar Duckworth got into a head to head battle right at the beginning of this month. And it's been really taking over our whole, it really took over our whole lives in the beginning of May, um, where we were literally glued to our phones thinking that there were going to be surprise drops. I don't have to tell you about what happened. You were there. But the reason why this is going to be featured is because I do a segment that you all should know. Haven't done one in a minute because of the, you know, shout out to Coco rocking with me for four episodes for uh, the Toxic Track series. Go and check it out. All of them available um, on Austrian platforms right now. Four parts. Good, good work. We did good, good work. It's hilarity at its finest. I think every episode is about an hour and a half. Um, very timeless, um, evergreen content. Talking about a lot of classic tracks that are just seething with toxicity. Go and get into it and make sure you go and keep up with Coco at Keeping Up With Coco everywhere. You can go to those episodes to find her at. Um, but while this, all this, you know, calamity was going on, that was what I was putting out. So I'm, you know, feeling like I'm falling behind a little bit, but it's cool because it's still relevant. Still relevant. It's so relevant. Let me give y'all some numbers. Because this is the vibe minute for, for this particular episode. And I screenshotted something. I screenshotted something, right? That I found so funny. These are the numbers. These are the numbers for this whole Drake battle. If we're just talking numbers for each diss track, this Drake and Kendrick battle for the diss tracks, right? Not like us. Debuts at number one with 7.9 million streams. Euphoria is is number three right now at 40 million. And then the future and Metro Boomer record featuring Kendrick Lamar is at number six at 34.2 million streams. And then Meet the Grams debuted at 27 million. Now, flip side, Drake, Family Matters debuted at 38 million. Pretty good. And then at number seven at 38 million, excuse me. And then number 17 at 18 million for push ups. What? He beat them in the numbers game. Now, I won't spend too much time on this because everybody is always already given all of the takes when it comes to this overall battle. Um, I do think that it's interesting because, first thing, Drake fans are wrong. They're so wrong. It's no way around it. And I think that there is the the quiet part that's not being said out loud is that they don't like their they don't like their faith being beat up on like this. That's really what it is. It's just like with a team, you know, you're rooting for a team that's you know contenders that's talented, but when they lose to anybody, it always hurts. It feels wrong. And I said this on another Element podcast, a podcast that I produced and co host you know co hosted with. Uh, Morgan Sherman, Neo.com back in Chicago. The biggest thing that I noticed about hip hop and the reason why like certain hip hop fans and hip hop, you know, fanatics of certain 
people or certain acts go so hard, it's because either they're the person they placed their bets on early is winning and had won the game pretty much, or the person that they really wanted to win never really won. And they there maybe is some reason as to why they feel like they didn't get a shot. It's very reminiscent of sports. People who are big, big, you know, Tracy McGrady fans and Vince Carter fans, you know what I'm saying? They talk about where would they be, you know, if they didn't get hurt. They could have been better than Kobe. You know, shit like that. Same way when it comes to rap, too. Like, where would certain rappers be if they had, you know, didn't get caught up in some type of mess, didn't, you know, get caught up with some, you know, maybe the criminal system or or maybe get caught up with, you know, bad deals, whatever it is, where would they be? Their run was a run. And we all thought that they would probably be around forever and they were not, you know? So I get it. I get it. But I think we live in an age now where honestly, it's opened up. The fact that the concept of the big three can even be something that we talk about shows the progression and the proliferation of hip hop as a whole. So I think it's something to cheer about. You know what I'm saying? Let's get a little bit of cheers in here. A little bit of a little bit of cheers, you feel me? But I think that to me, I do believe that Drake fans need to, you know, it's not even about being objective. It's about just really just looking at what you're listening to and, and, and also considering not trying to overextend what the person that you're rooting for is doing. Sports, I think, works as a great analogy for a lot of things because it's just cut and dry. Somebody made more shots. Somebody made more touchdowns, somebody scored more, somebody ran harder, somebody ran faster. It's just, you see it, you believe it. Unlike rap, being an art form, it's sub the subjectivity that's a part of it creates a lot of range for people to not accept what's pretty clear. And the thing that I think is pretty clear is that Drake was out-strategized, truly out-rapped. And from the angles that were taken, and the art that was created, it was way more substantive, which kind of has always been the thing when it comes to, you know, Kendrick versus Drake, uh, which is funny to me because I, I thought it was funny that at some point, you know, early on before Kendrick even dropped Euphoria, a lot of people was acting like Kendrick was the, I don't know, like the underdog or the, the he is the, he was the underdog in context of like people knowing him and all that. But I was so surprised to find out how many people were just like going to be like, he ain't going to win because he's just going to give us some weird alien voices over jazz. I'm like, are we really, are y'all serious right now? Or like y'all really that deep into Drake them? And I'm personally a person of semantics. The man doesn't write a lot of his bars and that's not a, you know, I'm not condemning him for it. It's more so like, we don't know when he pushes that button. We don't know if he pushed that button for this situation that's going on right now. We don't know. So the validity, like, it doesn't mean that he can't rap. Doesn't mean he can't, he doesn't have, he just doesn't have the time. He's too big of a machine that he has to be able to output things. So in my mind, I'm like, yeah. More than likely, he's written some of his best music, but also more than likely somebody else has to. And that's a part that I think a lot, it's hard for a lot of people to accept. And I think, he is only the master of the direction, the art, like the creative direction of where he was, what's going on, even if other people are writing. So I still think that give him credit for mastering those things. But at this point in time, Drake is in need of a, a major, major creative and brand shift in a lot of ways. And then um, morality and hip hop. I'll, I'll wrap it up on that. Morality in hip hop. Questlove gave this, you know, real, you know, emboldened speech about how hip hop is dead because, you know, everybody basically wants blood and, you know, it got so low and got so dark in terms of these, you know, battles that they were going against, the battle that they, you know, put up and the things they said to each other and about each other. But keep in mind, I don't think you should be looking for morality in hip hop. Just shouldn't. Morality has been gone from hip hop damn near since the beginning. And I'm going to tell you why. You have such situations as, you know, when gangster rap kind of was introduced with N.W.A. in various different forms and a lot more grittier rap came in there after being with, you know, Wu-Tang Clan and so on and so forth. Prior to that, where, you know, it was very conscious rap, thinking about Public Enemy, African Bambada, 
Curtis Blow, so on and so forth, right? You know, talking about late 70s throughout the 80s. The thing about it, though, is Africa Bambata had had charges, <laughs> pedophilic charges. Some of those people weren't good people. And that's okay. It's not okay that they weren't good people. But it's okay that that's a part of hip hop. These are people, and those are the founders, and that is what they did. Now, so much has happened, so much has transpired, but I don't think we should be looking at morality for hip hop because it's an art form that came from the amalgamation of genres prior to, and you literally was used to be able to tell the stories and the plight of the black and brown people um, of the Bron of Bronx, New York, uh, which was not a, you know, was not a deluxe apartment in the sky. Ha ha. You feel me? It was the Bronx. So it was a lot of shit going on. So, and people had to do what they had to do. And I think that we can't really get into the morality thing when we're talking about people who sell drugs, people who do drugs, people who have to rob, steal and kill to, you know, be able to survive. I'm not judging the behavior. It's more so like this is, these are the people who are the rappers of today. And that still holds true majority of the class of rappers that come out are either gangsters, gang bangers, drug pushers or drug users. The people that come out that are like the, 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 the Talib Kweli's who had, who had two parents that were educators and all that. That's not the norm. And even he doesn't show flaws, extreme flaws. He doxing women and shit, harassing people online. Yeah. I don't look for morality in hip hop at all, at all. We're talking about hip hop being a black art form at its genesis that is going to obviously put all of black flaws for everybody to judge, for everybody to judge. So to me, that's how I see it. That's just really what it is. And that is your vibe minute. Um, getting into the main topic of the day, how to be wrong. Something that came to me um, throughout watching this battle and just kind of in the past few weeks, uh, I really was struck with this idea of like, you know what? People really do not like being wrong. There may even be a fear of being wrong. Uh, my overall kind of, you know, thesis to this episode really is I believe that there is a very human aversion to the idea of being wrong. I attempt to express that being wrong is the shadow parts of ourself that we need to accept and be more whole. Now, this is a pretty, you know, deep, you got to be, you know what I'm saying, in your deep self-help, self-development, self-growth bag to, you know what I'm saying, really understand, but I won't hold you too long to, you know, to really be able to break it down because I got some points. I got a few points. Let me first read what I wanted to quote, what I quoted, uh, the first thing that came up when I was kind of just trying to find, you know, what's out there, what came up was, came up was, uh, from what's this Rubis and Rubisek and Thacker.com Rubisek and Thacker.com. I think they, it's like a blog titled, why do some people hate being wrong? And this was the list of things that they kind of listed that I thought was really intriguing. It says, they discover that people are uncomfortable admitting mistakes experience the following. They hate to look and feel weak. Hmm. They believe it will leave them susceptible to rejection. They tend to have deep-seated insecurities. Hmm. They tend to have an extreme need for approval from others. They tend to be perfectionists, and they will behave defensively if someone points out their errors. And then they go on to kind of, you know, I believe Mark Goldston, um, who I've who I've seen before, and I've, I've seen before do like podcasts and things like that, goes on to say, maybe we are wrong about being wrong. And I'll, I'll continue to read. Mark Goldston, the author of the book, Just Listen, wrote an article about the benefits of the risk and failure. He said he could see a direct correlation between difficulty and being wrong and the rigidity of your personality. He submitted that the more rigid one's disposition is with fewer actions, skills, feels fewer adaptation skills, the stronger the negative experience one has with being wrong 
he continued by suggesting that the breakdowns we have when we are faced with being wrong are our best opportunities for building billion. Mm. I learn so much about myself when I'm dealing with loss. You know, I learn so much about myself when I fall short. Whatever Kendrick said, it all applies. And then longer a person lives in life without being faced with being wrong, helicopter parents, enabling relationships, the more rigid one's personality becomes, thus increasing the difficulty in experiences where one must face their errors. Being wrong does not make us weak, but builds fancy and wisdom. Research claims that when someone admits their errors, they open themselves up for learning and growth, showcase their willingness to work hard and not just sit in their comfort zone, and demonstrate how much they value honesty and truth. Enforce humility in their lives. I'm not perfect, and that's okay. Tend to be more highly regarded, trusted, and exemplified, and inspire a deep sense of accountability in those around them. Demonstrate their expectations as realistic and achievable. Go crazy, Mark Ghosting. To continue on, um, that inspired me to write a little bit, and I'll and I'll give you a little bit of what I feel. Um, I believe that Black people specifically emulate a lot of when it comes to our collective parasocial relationships with Black celebrities. And I think it ranges in degrees. This, is what, this, this was coming from a place of just, you know, noticing the beef and noticing just the trend that I think I've seen over time of when kind of, you know, almost related to my whataboutism episode that I did earlier this year. There's always this very interesting and immediate protection that I think so many Black men specifically and just Black people in general, depending on who it is, have for people when they are being held up to and accused of doing something extremely terrible. And I'll continue to read. I think it ranges in degree in terms of impact that public figures have on the black population. But in recent years, I think that there is a direct correlation to the feelings that people have that they implement into their lives based on the lives of black celebs. So because of this phenomenon, we all have a very specific relationship with these people's transgressions. They are points of debate because of the range and degree people feel attached to these various figures. I think that we are in a time where Black representatives has made us so hypersensitive, hyper, hyperactive, and attached to the outcomes. Due to all of this, it negates the opportunity for accountability because public figures, uh, it's their jobs to manage their image and likeness for mass appeal. While a private citizens shouldn't put that on themselves, I think that many of us do. Yeah. A lot of us assume the position of being our own publicist, our own everything, because we're trying to either censor, self-correct ourselves and all these various things. And some people don't do it at all. Um, I think that there is a certain social respect show up in a way where you respect other people's agency. Where you move with the times, you don't fight progression. I'm for all those things. But I think that there is a very specific thing that happens when people at in high places with high visibility. When they go through certain things, I think that there's specifically a thing that happens where people are like, well, I mean, shoot, I mean, such and such got that off, so shit, I should be able to get it off too. And I don't think that that's how that works. I really don't. Uh, personally, I'm in a space now where I have certainly contended with the things that may be subjectively and objectively incorrect uh, if put on display for judgment by others. I think this is something that has made social media into a space where personas aren't the preferred, but Gaining the explicit vulnerability of who you are to the world speaks to the quality of your social pages. And that's really just me getting my own shit off. I feel like because there is this interesting idea of where regular people are starting to manage their own perceptions as if they are public figures because of social media, it create, it's now created this idea that people want real people. I think it's created this desire for authenticity in a way that I think I never really had to think about because I think I look at social media in similar ways as celebrities looked at other media forms. Like you go in a magazine, you present a character, you present a persona, you write entertainment and or whatever it is that you provide on whatever platform you have. And that's how I've always approached social media. But I'm realizing that archaic is becoming a very archaic way of thinking and approaching social media. You've got to put yourself on there. People are not following you for what you can come up with, but following you just to know you. Um, which, you know, that whole tidbit is something, something else. Um, and then I'll add, I also got something more from Mark uh, Golston. 
who's uh, I believe a a licensed uh, psychologist. But from Psychology Today, being wrong and why people can't stand it is the name of this particular article. And I forgot what it was. Where was it that I actually wanted to quote from this? No, I, I can't remember where it was. I wanted to quote from this. Okay, here it is. Here it is. So he is quoting from a book by Catherine Schultz, Being Wrong. And um, she said, it advocates doubt as a skill and praises error as the foundation of wisdom. Her book would enforce my encouragement of Harvard's accomplished, successful freshman to embrace risk and even failure. This is a book that he, uh, he wanted all Harvard uh, freshmen to read. The book caused me to think about why being wrong is so difficult for so many people. In addition to Schultz's uh, notions, it occurred to me that there is a direct, let me call, call you back, Ma, um, a direct connection, correlation between difficulty in being wrong and rigidity of your personality. The more rigid and the less adaptive your personality, the more difficult in being wrong. Why is that? And he continues. Because if you think of the foundation of your personality as being the way you you're thinking, um, your way your way your thinking brain, emotional fight or flight, action or reaction, um, your brain, our brains are configured with each other. More rigid in configuration, aimed at a specific end, the more difficult it will be to reconfigure towards a different end. Which I take that as like, if we start to genuinely start to, it's it's. There already is an uh, immediate aversion because it feels good to be right. It feels good to guess things correctly without really knowing if you really know the answer. It feels good to just be on the right side of things, to bet. I think that's what the the, the reaction to gambling is, is feeling like you have a sense and an intuition on something happening the exact way that you believe it should. And I think when it comes to ourselves and it comes to life planning, you dedicate yourself you invest time you invest energy into things and so when they don't pan out to a certain degree it really genuinely affects you and that's something that i want to you know kind of spend a little bit of time on um because i think that that's where i this, this is where the aversion comes and, and and truly perpetuates the most in our lives is when we're wrong about us when we're wrong about ourselves when we went to college and this is where it gets deep you go to college, you do, you know, you get your, your degree in whatever it is, and then you immediately think that you have maybe done enough internships, maybe done enough work. Okay. Maybe you've done enough internships, maybe you've done enough work, and now here you are. Still not feeling like you're in, in your best, you know, situation, having to pivot and do something completely different than your, you know, your degree, and you're trying to fight your way back in or fight your way to doing something that's more aligned with what you really want to do. And I can understand that feeling like a lot of things. The remorse, fulfilling of making a decision, committing to that decision, and then not panning out either because of the job or things outside of your control feels like shit. So you'd rather not even take risks. you rather always do the smartest and safest thing, even though those things may not always be the most rewarding and the most satisfying, to be quite honest. Um, I pivot to, you know, I think that specifically talking to men, um, something that I'm, you know, really working on right now, I can give y'all a little bit of, you know, insight on is um, I really genuinely want to create something. I want to write more. I want to document, get into my kind of, you know, interview documentarian type bag of, you know, I'm really, I'm really getting intrigued with the idea of, you know, bringing in more journalistic qualities into my work, um, writing more, getting more, you know, personal stories from people, collecting these personal stories and you know, using that to draw a, a broader conclusion. And I think for men, I want to speak to and ask them very specific questions. And I think a friend of mine, shout out to Deanna, um, she's in Dallas right now, but I met her in Chicago. It's one of Chicago homies. And one thing that she had said to me after the scandal of the, you know, the brick lady kind of started was, you know, she didn't understand why so many men are just so un unaccountable. Like, why are so like this? Why was so hard about black men being accountable? What is up with that? Like, I don't like that. I feel like it would make things so much better if they just be accountable. It's just simple. Like, why can't they be accountable? What is it, Ryan? And I told her that there isn't a culture of accountability. 
I don't think that there's ever really been a genuine culture of accountability for black men to genuinely emulate. And I mean that in totality. And I know a lot of people may not agree with me. I know a lot of people may reference things from the past, but there's so many examples from the past that we can give, you know, you know, some way of acknowledgement to that did not give accountability. And even when it comes to a broader context of social, of just the, you know, just our society and just, you know, looking at things from a social context, no, so many people circumvent accountability all the time. People are like, this country is so litigious so that you can circumvent accountability. I have enough money. I can give you some money so that I'm really not really punished for this. I have enough power and influence. We can void all of this. I have enough access that this didn't really even happen. So it doesn't matter. I can give you something to kind of make it go away. I can give you something to make it, whatever I did wrong to you, feel a little bit better. And I think that men need to get close. And comfortable with accountability. Get close with being wrong. Because I think that it would cure so many of the headaches that so many men find themselves in on a consistent basis where they're arguing with people, where they're, I've seen something beautiful online just earlier today, uh, this podcast where they record everything like in nature. It's real, it's real interesting podcast. And basically they stated how, you know, so many men are, you know, object to the idea of like being vulnerable and really allowing love in because, you know, they don't want to lose it. So that fear of losing love makes them heighten all of these you know, very, you know, aggressive and hyper masculine and toxic masculine uh, traits, qualities and actions uh, because control feels a lot better and more comfortable than love because love, you got to give in. You know what I'm saying? You got to let the, you got to let that love in. You got to release that. You got to release your muscles. You feel me? And I think that that's a big, big thing that we don't really genuinely uh, do more of. And I just kind of commented and said, like, you know, control dynamics and power dynamics is something that a lot of men opt into, you know, inherently. Hence why there's this real genuine sense to hustle, make as much money, get as much knowledge, or gain as much access, um, and also get your health to a certain degree so that you can have genuine power and influence over other people. Um, but I, I did an episode called, you know, men, I think it's called like men and accountability of men need accountability, something like that. It was technically the first YouTube video I posted on my channel. Um, like just video video where me, like me on camera, but it was a terrible quality. Still go and listen. Good. So, but I was nervous out, out the ass after that. And I, I think I didn't end up recording another video for another year. But because I just spooked myself out of it. It wasn't even like I had, you know, camera anxiety or nothing like that. It was genuinely like, I think I'm fucking this up. You know, I think I'm doing this wrong. Um, and it's crazy that I did it on such a sensitive topic. Um, but I think that, like I said in that episode, men have this real interesting thing about morality. And they don't know. They rather, you know, be on, be very tribal when it comes to men because they look at themselves as being flawed. So they don't want to judge men too harshly because it's like, shit, they could say something to me. They could say something about me. They could say something about what I got going on and what I'm doing. I ain't perfect. I ain't rich. I ain't whatever, whatever. And I think men use those things to keep moving the goalposts as to why they don't have to hold each other accountable. Because it's like that nigga trying. He got a job. He a man. He a whatever. And it's instead... There's no space given in that. And I think that that's the problem when it comes to the idea of accountability, because I think so many men see accountability as them basically cowtelling and, you know, acquiescing to a bunch of demands that they, that they feel like is making them weak. Goes back to the idea of, you know, being wrong. It's like, what is it? What does it really genuinely make you feel? And I think a lot of men don't like the idea of being wrong or they change the idea of being wrong into a positive so that way they still don't can don't have to really be accountable for it. it's like yeah i'm a dickhead i'm a it is what it is you know what i'm saying it is what it is i could be wrong I'm, yeah fuck you it is what it is but in reality you feel you holding that you feel that way when you realize that you can't get the same access into the same spaces and places with people in certain ways you're affected by that that affects you the fact that somebody can forever hold something over your head because you still have yet to say that you are sorry, which 
goes to, you know, my last point, and that's how to apologize. And then we can wrap this up. Um, how to apologize. I think this is something that, you know, comes up a lot, right? Um, specifically with public figures, like I said, but I think that there's a parasocial relationship that people, I think a lot of people live their lives through that. And um, now with the proliferation of podcasts in recent years, a lot of people feel like, you know, well, shit, I can be, I can be just like them. I can be just as popular as them. I can be, have just as many followers as the, the next nigga. So yeah, I do got an image to protect. I do got an image to think about because your life, quote unquote, could be ruined just like these dudes. So allegations and all these things are harmful. They shouldn't happen. You shouldn't be saying these things. Who are these niggas are very common phrases. But I think that apologizing is something that's highly examined these days because a lot of people don't do it well. There's a whole lot of I'm sorry if you felt this way type of formatting and apology. And I want you all to know something. If no one's ever told you, if you've never really been, if it's never been said to you in a calm tone, that's not how you apologize. An apology should not only be accountable, it should have a lot of I statements. It should be, I am sorry, I. Right after the I am sorry, I, or that I, did this to you. Validating what it is that they are saying. And then speak to how you want to change. Speak to how you understand the severity of what it is. Give you an example. Let's say I, you know, dismiss something in a conversation and you really felt some type of way about it. It really fucked you up. It really got you fucked up. And I say to you, I'm sorry. I dismissed your feelings in this situation. In this conversation, that wasn't my intention, but I see that that's exactly what happened. And I don't want to do that again. I don't want you to feel that way. And I care about what you say. I think I'm maybe activated by these things that were said and that made me dismiss what you said. But that's no excuse. I want to hear you out. I want you to hear me out. I want us to have a, a healthy conversation right now. And that's all. That's all you got to do. And for some people, for some men, that's such a hard thing to do because it feels so vulnerable. It feels so, but I'm going to let y'all in on a very well-known secret <laughs> that it shouldn't even be called a secret at this point. If you are, if you are leading with a it makes all of those difficult conversations you have with friends, family, and your in, you know, intimate partners so much easier. Claim it. Even if you don't understand it in that moment, understand that them saying it, it's real to some degree. So you make it real, you, you justify it, you, un you understand it, and you move on. It's not a way to shut people up. It's not a way to, to try to get through the conversation. Never come off that way. Let it be something that you let space come into and like really let it breathe, let it breathe. Um, but that's it. You know, that's, that's, that's really what it is. That's where I wanted to sit, you know, talk to y'all about. We are almost at our 250th episode, but before we, cause this is episode 249, but before we do that, let's send it on. Send it on is my call to action portion of the episode. And I wrote down pretty much everything I wanted to say. And uh, it's simple. This one is simple. It's in, you know, in the heart of the episode, lean into being wrong. If you are a person that, and not in a straightforward way, obviously don't, you know, don't be obtuse and incorrect. And please, we have enough contrarians in the world. We got enough devil's advocates. We don't need no more. We don't need no more devil advocates. We don't need no more devil's advocates. We don't need no more. Let that be a movie featuring Keanu Reeves and Al Pacino. Let that be that and move on. But I, what I mean is, uh, be reasonable with your research. Uh, be a free thinker. Really think and, you know, allow yourself to, you know, really take in information, process information and see how it applies to you. And always have the best intentions that don't affect or hurt anyone else. And so that way, when you are wrong, you don't be annoyed by the idea of accountability. Because it's like you try. You try to be prepared and have the right information so that you're never saying the wrong things and your heart was in the right place. So when, even when you are saying something out of, you know, maybe ego, whatever, whatever, whatever the blind spot that you didn't notice, it's all good. It's all good at the end of the day. You know, that's what it is. 
That's what it is. You know what I'm saying? And I, as I, you know, pull up, I didn't know it was it was still playing music on this thing. That's crazy. The whole time. Is it playing? Is it playing? That's coming up. But at, and that's really the episode. I, I I wanted to, you know, like I said, try out this uh mini episode situation and really see about it, you know. I think that the thing that I need to understand right now as I'm gearing up for this 250th episode is that I am only a man of one. I've been doing this by myself for a long time. And I got to always find ways to make it easier for me. I really do. I really do. And I think that a part of making it easier is using the tools that are right in front of me, like Riverside, shout out to Riverside, to do those things with. Um, but you can be wrong. And it's okay to be wrong. Not this thing is trying to really, this thing really trying to mess up my flow. This is what we're going to do. We're going to turn that off. But if you don't know, you should know. You can follow me everywhere at Kings underscore memoirs. Follow the podcast. Follow the podcast at Simply King Pod on IG. And um, make sure that you go and follow and subscribe anywhere that you can listen, anywhere that you're listening. Make sure you go and subscribe to the YouTube and comment, like, and share. I appreciate y'all. I uh, appreciate y'all. I appreciate y'all. Next week is the 250th episode, and I'm, it's a surprise, you know, what the topic is going to be and what it's going to be about. Uh, I think y'all going to be very surprised by it. But tap in with me. Tune in to it. Appreciate y'all in advance. All right. They get your hammy downs and party at the party playing with his nose now. And Baca got a weird case. Why is he around? Certified neighbor boys, certified pedophiles.